Good afternoon, evening, morning, or middle of the night, depending on what time zone you're in. I'm Stefan Muller, and I'll be giving the first part of this talk. My co-author Kyle will give the second half. This is joint work with several other collaborators at CMU and WashU in St. Louis. Back in a previous decade, when conferences took place at upper halls in St. Louis instead of the guest bedroom I've turned into a temporary office, I was at ICFP 2018 talking about why we want to combine high-level parallelism abstractions such as futures, which are often known as cooperative parallelism, with the responsiveness of traditional concurrency, sometimes called competitive. Well, I recently realized that I was coming into my own as an academic when my inbox started looking like this. To add insult to injury, now every time I open my email client, I get asked if I want to compact the local folder to save disk space, because my email is just taking up too much space. So, OK, why not? Sounds good. This is a bit of an exaggeration, but surely you've all started a computation that takes way longer than you think it should to finish. So we're in luck. There are actually a whole slew of languages that are designed to take a big computation and make it go faster by using multiple processors. The problem is that there is one thread, or maybe a, a small number of threads, for handling the event loop of the, the email client. Another thread to handle compacting the emails in the background. Of course, we just said that we're trying to parallelize that. So it's actually not just one thread compacting emails. It's many, many threads compacting emails. And so the runtime of these, of these cooperative languages isn't able to distinguish between the one thread that's running the event loop and the thousands or millions of threads that are compacting emails. And so the result of that is that your event loop gets run whenever the scheduler happens to get around to it, which is not the best thing for responsiveness. This prior work extended futures with priorities, allowing programmers to specify using the future create or fcreate keyword annotated with a priority that a particular computation should happen in parallel with the rest of the program, thus spawning a new lightweight thread or future at that priority. When the results of the future are needed in either the main thread or another part of the program, they can be retrieved with future touch or F touch, which waits for the future to complete and returns its value. For clarity, I'm outlining with black rectangles pieces of the program that logically belong to the same thread. In later parts of the talk, I'll drop these boxes when they're not necessary for understanding. The prior work has also shown bounds on the response time of threads, allowing us to prove, for example, that our email client's compression scales with the number of processors while the event loop never takes too long to respond. In order for these bounds to hold, though, a program needs to not have any priority inversions, in which a high priority thread waits on a low priority one. In past work, we've ruled out priority inversions with modal type systems that track the priorities of futures and require that at a touch, the current priority is lower than the priority of the touched future. Because long Zoom meetings are confusing and exhausting enough as it is, this will be the only inference rule in this talk. After writing our parallel email client, though, we've realized that you can't actually read an email while it's being compressed. If an email is being compressed, the thread that displays it needs to coordinate with the compression thread to prevent emails from being in an inconsistent state. This requires coordinating through shared memory. Unfortunately, all of the prior work I've talked about has assumed that programs are purely functional. In particular, that means that futures, which are first-class values and can be passed around through a program, can't be stored in global state. If we allow this, we open up new patterns of dependencies that weren't possible before. For example, the handle to the print thread here can be written into a global variable so that it can then be touched by the compressed thread. In this paper, we discuss why this pattern of dependencies breaks the prior results on responsiveness bounds and how we fixed it by developing a new cost model for imperative parallel programs. We formalize these ideas using a core calculus for an imperative parallel language with a type system that guarantees a lack of priority inversions. We've also implemented these ideas, including a way to enforce the priority restrictions through types in C++, and evaluated the performance of the implementation. We won't have time in this talk to discuss the calculus and type system, but we'll touch on the other contributions and invite you to read the paper for more details. We model programs as directed acyclic graphs, or DAGs, where the nodes are portions of the computation and edges are dependencies. Running the program then corresponds to assigning nodes to processors at each point in time, respecting the dependencies. This is called a schedule of the DAG. Let's suppose we have two processors. Then we'll want to keep both of them busy whenever possible and also preferentially assign higher priority nodes. Such a schedule is called prompt. For a prompt schedule, if we take a thread represented by a piece of the DAG, say this piece I've outlined in gold, we want to be able to bound the response time or the total time that it's in the system. 
Intuitively, this response time should only depend on the amount of work that may happen in parallel with the gold outline piece, so not including ancestors or descendants, and is at a higher or equal priority. The gold outline thread may compete with this other work for CPU time, so we have to consider all of this work outlined in gray, and not just the thread itself. We'll call this the competitor work. In addition to just the amount of work, bounds on execution times of parallel programs also depend on the length of the critical path, the longest chain of dependencies, often called the spam. Because futures can create complex dependency graphs, the critical path of a future may extend beyond the future itself. For example, these red edges make up the critical path of the medium priority thread outlined in gold. We'll call this the thread's spam. Now I'll show how this model changes when future handles can be shared through state. Consider this DAG in which the medium priority thread depends on this high priority thread, and suppose we want to bound the response time of the medium priority thread. The competitor work is just what's outlined in gray here. Even though the blue nodes may happen in parallel with the medium priority thread, because they're at a lower priority, they shouldn't interfere with the execution of the medium priority thread. But one of the blue nodes appears to be on the critical path of the medium priority thread, and so needs to be included in its span. This would be a problem, because having lower priority nodes on the span constitutes a priority inversion and breaks our theory. We need a way to recover a notion of the thread span in order to be able to get bounds on the cost. Let's look closer, though, at what it means to be on the critical path, and whether this node labeled A really is on the critical path of the medium thread. What I mean when I say this is that the last node of the medium thread, node B, may have to block waiting for A to finish. It turns out, though, that this can't actually happen. The reason is that, in order for this dependency edge to exist, the medium priority thread must have somehow obtained a handle to the high priority thread. That can only have happened through global state, meaning that some code in here wrote the high priority futures handle into a global variable, and some code in here read it. The write must have happened before the read, so we have an implicit dependency. Let's be more concrete and say that the write and read are these vertices I've connected with the dotted line. We'll call that dotted line a weak edge, and it indicates the implicit dependency that the target of the edge had to have happened after the source at runtime, together with these explicit dependency edges. That tells us that node A must have already been executed before node B is ready. We need to alter the definition of a thread span accordingly. The way we do this is by constructing what we call a strengthening of a DAG. This constructs a DAG with no weak edges that corresponds to the worst case implied by the weak edge. In this DAG, the worst case would be that the high priority thread doesn't start running until the same time as the read. For simplicity, let's be slightly more conservative and assume it starts right after the read. We can represent this with a normal non-weak edge from the reading vertex to the start of the high priority thread. At this point, both the weak edge and the existing incoming edge are redundant, so we can remove them. This gives the strengthening of the DAG. It has the same worst case, but the span of its threads is more straightforward to calculate. In particular, there are now no low priority vertices on the span of the medium priority thread. With these definitions in place, for a prompt schedule and a thread and a DAG, we can bound the response time of the thread by a formula that depends only on the competitor work and span of a thread in the strengthening and the number of processors. This bound looks quite similar to the famous Brent's theorem for parallel scheduling and intuitively says that at each time step we're either doing p units of work toward the competitor work or making progress along the critical path. Hello, I'm Kyle Singer and I will be taking over for the rest of the talk. Let's dive into the implementation in C++ by first looking at how we represent priorities. We encode priorities as classes where the inheritance relationships between those classes dictate the ordering. If we continue with our high, medium, and low priority example, we would start by defining the low priority class in our inheritance diagram. In order to define medium as higher than low, we would have it inherit from the low priority class like so. Similarly, the high priority would inherit from medium. The C++11 standard provides means for checking the inheritance relations between two classes at compile time, which allows us to check the ordering of priorities to detect inversions. It is also worth noting that this inheritance model allows us to encode partial orderings because the inheritance relationship forms a directed acyclic graph. Suppose we had another priority that should be ordered above low, but has no relation to medium or high. Then we can simply define this priority, let's call it not low, as inheriting from the low class. Not low is now higher priority than low, but has no ordering relative to medium or high. To check for priority inversions at compile time, we use template types to track the current priority, and we use C++11 static assert to catch priority inversions. 
For example, say we had a function foo that f creates bar as shown in the example. Because we f create bar, we require bar to be templated with a priority such that it can track its own priority. Because foo takes part in an f touch, we also require that it be templated with its own priority so we can check for a priority inversion on the touch. The future handle must also be templated with a priority to be used in this ftouch operation. After translating this somewhat idealized syntax into the corresponding C++ code, the fcreate of bar would be translated into an instantiation of a handle and a call into the underlying scheduler, telling it to generate the bar task at priority row and associate it with the handle. Exactly what happens here is dependent upon the scheduler implementation. The ftouch, on the other hand, gets translated into a static assert comparing the row stored with the handle to the row prime of the current function, and a touch to the handle. If row is less than row prime, then the compiler will fail the assert and compilation will halt. This static assert does not get compiled into the final binary. The C++ type system we have implemented is not as ironclad as it would be in a functional language. In C++, we can do things like separate the creation of the future handle from the fcreate, and we have the ability to arbitrarily change the types of our variables via typecasts. So we require a couple restrictions to guarantee that there are no priority inversions. First, the C++ type system implementation will guarantee that the code is free of priority inversions so long as unsafe typecasts are avoided. If we, for example, did a typecast on the handle as shown on the left, we would end up comparing the wrong priority values as shown on the right, potentially introducing a priority inversion. Thus, we require that unsafe typecasts be avoided. We also require one further restriction, that the programmer ensures that fcreate of a handle occurs before ftouch on the same handle as is shown here. In C++, it is possible to allocate a handle separately from the fcreate, which can introduce problems. The example shown is correct because the high priority handle f is only stored in global state after the fcreate. Therefore, when we access the handle, we know that high priority thread is executing and we don't need to wait on low priority nodes when the touch occurs at medium priority. However, if we were to put the handle in global state too early, it could result in the scenario shown here, where the medium priority f touch node may need to wait on low priority nodes before the fcreate occurs, which would be an inversion. Now let's talk about evaluation. We developed several case studies in our C++ framework and implemented a prototype runtime scheduler with which to run them. Recall that promptness involves preferentially scheduling high priority nodes as soon as they become available. This would have a lot of overhead in practice because the scheduler would need to track global information to find the high priority work and would potentially require frequent preemption of processors to move them from lower priority work to higher priority work. Because of this, for evaluation, we instead extended Silk Plus to approximate promptness and handle priorities in iSilk. This means that we use work stealing because it is a provably and practically efficient distributed scheduling protocol that is used by Silk Plus and many other existing task parallel platforms. In work stealing, each processor core has its own double-ended queue of work. The processors push and pop work using the bottom of their local deck until they run out of work at which point they will look to steal from the top of another processor's double-ended queue like so. In Silk Plus, there is only one work stealing scheduler, but in iSilk, we have one instance per priority in the runtime. Each of these instances has its own allocation of processors, and there is a master scheduler that acts as a processor allocator to decide how many processors should be allocated to each scheduler instance. The master scheduler will periodically reevaluate the processor allocation at a fixed interval, typically on the order of hundreds of microseconds to milliseconds. After each time interval, the master scheduler will change the processor allocation to suit the current needs of the schedulers, favoring higher priority schedulers for allocations. The scheduling algorithm provides a provably good execution time bound, but in this work we are focused on the type system. For more details on the scheduler, I would refer you to our upcoming SPA paper for a detailed analysis of the scheduling algorithm. We then implemented several moderately sized application case studies, each over a thousand lines of code, using the type system and scheduler. Today we will focus on the multi-user email client case study. In this application, at the highest priority level, we handle requests from users coming in over a network socket, where requests translate to tasks to be executed at a lower priority. One such request at the next highest priority is the send request, in which a message is sent from one user to another. 
The user can also request that their own inbox be sorted, which runs at the next highest priority. A final request can be to print an email. At the lowest priority, there is a loop that occasionally checks if there are uncompressed emails and uses fcreate to start futures to compress email contents. This introduces an interesting dynamic between compression and printing, for we must be able to decompress the message before printing. This requires us to make use of the references we added to the type system and to make compression the same priority as print so we don't print a half-compressed message. We introduce weak edges into the graph by a compare and swap on the print and compress future handle references to achieve this. We collected timing data for the send, sort, print, and compress tasks for both a baseline version of Silk that supports futures and for the new iSilk scheduler that approximates promptness. We divided the time it took for each computation in the baseline by the time it took for each computation in iSilk, and thus higher values are better. We ran the application with 90, 120, 150, and 180 simulated users. The striped bars show a comparison of the average time for each task, and the solid bars show the 95th percentile comparison. The bars are ordered from highest to lowest priority for each configuration. The average values for the send task are out of bounds, and so we display a number next to their bars to show their values. As we can see, the scheduler appropriately prioritizes the highest priority send tasks and generally does better on the sort tasks at the expense of the lower priority tasks. Our other case studies in the paper show similar conclusions. I'd like to leave you with the list of our contributions again, as well as I have added at the bottom a link to our code, which is available at the provided URL on Zenodo. Thank you for your attention.